the application. It kind of brings all the dependencies in there with it. So it's kind of, it's, in, it's pretty much independent of any hooks into Dalvik, I, I believe. That's what it looks like to me. That's why you can use Ruby. But um, one other thing, I, I program in Java primarily at work. And Ruby is something I've kind of been piddling around with for years and haven't really done that that much with it, so I'm not really that familiar with Ruby programming. So, of course, after spending all this time and, and fiddling around with something that requires Ruby, I found the phone gap, which is pretty much an identical type of framework that uses HTML, CSS, and JavaScript and the language on the back end is Java. So I'll probably go with this. But they are also doing the same thing, where development is for iPhone, iPad, Android, Palm, Symbian, Blackberries. So it, Well, it, now, it, I, now I guess we see why they open sourced it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but the interesting thing, like Palm, the Palm development, it, you, they use HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So it seems to me kind of for the new web OS. Yep. Yeah. So it seems kind of ironic that here HTML has been getting such, you know, knocked because it's not a desktop experience, and as it's you know matured and they're doing all the AJAX stuff, and you have you know closer to a desktop experience. Now I guess it, it's good enough to to use it to develop native apps on mobile phones. So if you know CSS, HTML, and JavaScript, you can probably start making some of those Android apps and. Because that's really why they called it the web OS. <laughs> it's an operating system made out of HTML. Yeah. So you know, don't, can't get, uh, can't be too. And the and the it looks like the amount of back end coding that you need to do is, is just to get your data. So everything else seems to, you can pretty much do it in the, on the front end. It's it's more of a uh, a view centric. Development. Any questions? What do you mean by view centric? Well, you kind of develop your app from from the view side, as opposed to creating the data on the back end and then building your screens from from that perspective. You're doing most of your stuff. First of all, these tools seem to generate most of the basic code that you need. So if you have uh, any of them, Roo, uh, Row Mobile, um, Grails. You generally do a command line. What do I want to create? I want to create a model. So, gen or whatever, Grails, blah, 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 gen model. Tell it what fields you want, and it builds all of the code for you. It creates the entity, it creates the, uh, the front end web page for you. And so then what you do is you have the basic application framework in place, and you just have to go in there and add your custom code to it. So very productive. Much it creates the table for you in SQLite also? Um, some of them do, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah that is. Well, what you'll kind do of is, backwards. like with Grails, uh, yeah. It is kind of backwards. Yeah. Also, has anybody heard of Scala and the Lyft framework? It's the same, same approach that it's more from the view and that the back end kind of, so. The back end is what the front end needs. Yep, yep. Huh. And a lot of them, you know, you create like with um, uh, the Rue development, you pretty much just need to create the entity and it does all the hibernate stuff on the back end and you don't have to touch any of the database stuff. So I assume that's that's an object relational mapper that you're playing right there. Object re relational mapping that it, it sets up for you. And uh, the neat thing with with Roo, it uh, it uses Spring M MVC. It uses Hibernate. Um, it has plugins for for GWT and for Flex. So pretty much what you're doing is that you tell it what you want to build. And one of the really cool things about it is that it keeps a log of what, you're, what you've keyed in. So if you wanted to create like a standard template for an application, build it, 
save the log file, and then you can execute the log file and create the second application. So if you want to standardize on how you have your developers creating your apps, here's your, you know, here's your starting point. If you want to build a separate application, run this, and then go in and you can bring it up in an IDE, and it keeps track of what you've done in the IDE, and then it adds it to the log so that it doesn't, it keeps, stays in sync with what you're doing outside of Ruby. So, you know, with the different things that are coming out with the development environments, they are just gearing towards rapid development. And there's so much of it that's free. That's why I spend a lot of time bouncing from one thing to the other, to the other, to the other. And it's hard to focus on just one, one area. But the mobile stuff looks like it's getting pretty hot. And uh, they're talking about um, making changes to the Android uh, OS so that um, it'll run on other devices other than, than uh, phones. But they said right now that it's really not suited for other, other places, so they're working on getting it so that you can put it on larger devices. Yeah, it's my understanding that Android 3 is kind of fragmented in that they've got uh, the phone Android 3, they've got the uh, notepad, or uh, the tablet, the tablet, tablet, yeah, tablet of Android 3.0, and then there's mm -hmm. what are the whatever other devices. I mean, it's not fragmented in a bad way, but just kind of what the target is. So then to throw a big, ugly huh. wrench into the whole thing, <laughs> you know, Google. And anybody not familiar with what that lawsuit is? Where, or, I've heard of it, but not extremely. Well, there's uh, five or six things, I think, that they're pointing out that they're saying that by Google going off and creating its Darvik JVM, that they stepped on uh, Oracle's Java's toes and have copyright infringement. And um, I've read but a few of them are, and it just really basically seemed like things that are pretty common sense, typical things that you know that, that you would do. It's not not like any great you know revelation or any any incredibly innovative things that they're coming out with. But I thought it was interesting what James Gosling had to say about it. And his take is that there's no guiltless parties, nobody would play hats. Uh, it's much about patents or principles or it's more about ego, money, and power. And there was an article about uh, his comments, more going into more detail, and he said they <coughs> used to play games of coming up with software patents just to see if you know how ridiculous the software patents were that they could get. So for this to have any real credibility, I mean, it, it points out to the whole idea of software patents just not being good for for technology at all. Let's see if I can get to this. I actually have it up here. Okay. Of course, the, the uh, Free Software uh, Foundation uh, is going to uh, kick uh, in uh, at some point. Um, what was interesting about this is that they're they're kind of knocking Oracle for filing the suit, but they weren't terribly supportive of Google either. <laughs> and part of the reason is that, from what I understand, is that uh, they had several different choices on what open source JDK framework they could start with, and they chose uh, Harmony, which was an Apache licensed. Right, John? Oh, oh wait, who, right. who started with what? They, they, they looked at different open source JDKs. Who? Google. Google. To build up on, to, you know, to modify, to come up with the Darvik okay. JVM. Okay. They picked Harmony, which is Apache. They ignored something called, I think, Ice-T that had a GPL license. And according to this article, somewhere along here, they would have been better off if they'd gone with the GPL licensed um, Ice-T. 
and they probably would have had pretty much the same amount of work to modify to make it what they wanted it to be. Well, you think? just as a side note, Google is on the Java community process, the standards body, mm -hmm. and I actually voted for them to get on the ME specification. So they're part of the so they micro edition. Too, right? They're part of the micro edition mm -hmm. uh, uh, executive committee. So they're they're part of the standards body, and you know I I, I try to stay fairly back from it, but. Yes, there's a whole lot of dirtiness there. You know, Google's not got clean hands. You know, they say it's an assault on open source and it's an assault on Java. Well, the Dalvik VM, if their claim is that they created something cleanly on their own, then it can't be an assault on Java because it doesn't run Java. Now, if they say it is an assault on Java, then by proxy, they're agreeing to the fact that the Dalvik VM is a Java virtual machine, which actually points out that they are infringing. So there's a couple of other things there. It's not an assault on open source. Um, essentially, there's a number of points, technical and political <coughs> and monetary, that basically boil down to you know, Google and Oracle are both in the business of making money. So nobody's clean there. It's not an assault on open source technologies. Sun, and then later Oracle, is openly supporting OpenJDK, which is a GPL v2 licensed software. You can download it, you can run it. Ice-T is actually part of, the Ice-T project is actually part of OpenJDK. So there's there are alternatives. Now that's, that being said, OpenJDK is for the standard edition. Apache Harmony is standard edition. The micro editions were never opened up. Why? Because the manufacturers like Samsung, um, Motorola,